Welcome to Our Lady of Perpetual Help YouTube channel. My name is Father Tyler Strand, and today we're going to be discussing some of the important differences between the Eastern Catholic Church and the Western Catholic Church. People who visit the a Byzantine Catholic or Ukrainian Catholic Church, particularly if they are from a Roman Catholic background, initially feel disoriented, pun intended, because of the differences that they see in the way that the Eucharist is celebrated. But in fact, the basic outline of the Eucharist is quite the same in both. There is a liturgy of the catechumens, and then there is a liturgy of the sacrifice of the Mass. And these things we have in common in our common Catholic roots, going back to the very earliest days of Christianity. And so our beliefs about what it is that we are doing in the Eucharist are quite the same. How we celebrate it, how we express it, are slightly different given the differences in culture and to a certain degree politics between the Western Roman Empire and the Eastern Roman Empire, often called the Byzantine Church. The standard for the Western Mass was set in Rome, and the, the way that things were done in the papal churches and in the major churches of Western Christendom. The standard in the East was established eventually in the great cathedral of Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, uh, which is now uh, called Istanbul. The church is still standing. It is sadly a mosque again, but it was originally the greatest cathedral in the world. And the liturgical rite that was celebrated in the capital city of Constantinople is the standard by which the Eastern churches have celebrated the Eucharist ever since. It represents um, a combination of several things. First of all, the basics of all Christian celebration of the Eucharist is the Last Supper and our Lord's celebration of his body, giving us his body and blood in the form of the bread and the wine. But beyond that, we also have a celebration of the transcendence that this sacrament brings into the world. And for that reason, Christians have, throughout Catholic history, wanted to make this something special. And so it has been adorned with music and liturgical action and incense and all the things that make this quite grand. Now, here is an interesting thing. Those who are old enough to remember the old Roman Catholic Mass, or who have gone to the extraordinary form today, particularly if it is a pontifical liturgy and a bishop is celebrating, will see some of the basics that we have retained in all of our celebrations in the East. In other words, the beauty of all of that ornate liturgy, which is done only on special occasions, we do every Sunday. We have no such thing as a, as a low mass, really, anymore. There was a time in the Eastern Catholic Church when there was a simplified version, but it is rarely done anymore. So every Sunday for us is a solemn high mass. Every Sunday is a huge celebration which involves things that go back to the Byzantine period. The vestments that are worn are, are often can be directly uh, traced back to court dress of the Byzantine Empire. Particularly, you see that if the bishop is celebrating. The bishop's vestments are very different than Western bishop's vestments, and they represent what a bishop would wear in court in the presence of the emperor in the late Eastern Roman Empire. The Byzantine liturgy that we celebrate has never been reformed. So it, it, there's a principle about, about Byzantine liturgy, both in the Orthodox Church and the Eastern Catholic Church, that we have a real hard time removing anything, but we don't have a problem adding things on. Consequently, the bare outline, the outline of the actual, of the mass, of the liturgy, um, is sometimes hard to find in the Eastern Church, but it is there. Some, if you're going along thinking, well, they're adding more hymns, they're adding with this hymn, this hymn, this hymn, more psalms, more hymns, another procession, and then all of a sudden you hear the epistle reading or the gospel reading. You say, oh, now I know where we are. Yes, deeply embedded in all of our beautiful liturgy and all the ceremonial is the simplicity of 
the celebration of the Eucharist. And that both the Western Mass and the Eastern liturgy have in common. Um, we could, in theory, cut away much of the things that we have added. We wouldn't want to, but we could do that, and you would see then a much clearer parallel between the East and the West. But the principle is still there. We have gathered to hear the Word of God, to sing His praises, and then to be fed with His body and His blood, and that we all have in common. Those who come visiting our churches, particularly from a, a Roman Catholic background, might be advised not to, not to think too much. Part of the beauty of our liturgy is that you let it happen to you. On your first visit, although you can do some background reading, and there would be a copy of the liturgy in the pew if you want to try to follow along, and pages are announced, but sometimes for the first experience is just to sit or stand there and let the liturgy happen to you. Let the music roll over you. Let the incense en engulf you and, and see the beauty of the church decorations, particularly the icons. Treat it as meeting a person for the first time. And then later, it becomes more familiar to you. But remember that you are welcome in an Eastern church. And you don't have to do all the things we do. No one expects you to, your first visit, and you don't have to feel the odd man out because you've done it. Not, you don't know what to do. We cross ourselves a lot during the service. Every mention of the Holy Trinity, we are crossing ourselves. But that's not required. People aren't going to turn and look at you and say, oh, you, you're not from here, are you? We try to welcome all people coming to experience our liturgy. Because for us, the liturgy is one of the most powerful vehicles of evangelization. It is where we become the church in a very special way, where we come together for two hours on a Sunday, maybe more, and we are for that period lifted up to heaven to see how things ought to be in the presence of God and then gently left back down to earth again to go out and live our Christian lives, having been recharged and nourished at the liturgy. And that's what we invite people to who experience. It's often asked by visitors from the Roman, Roman Catholic Church, visiting an Eastern Catholic Church like ours, how does one become a member? And that's a, a kind of interesting question. You do not need a, a membership card to come in or to worship. Roman Catholics in good standing are certainly invited to come as often as they wish and to receive communion if they're in a proper state. In other words, if they have prepared the way they would for going to Mass in the West. If one wants to become a full member of the Eastern Catholic Church, that involves what they call a change of right. And that is a bureaucratic process by which you, uh, you petition for that. Good reason must be given, um, but being in love with us, I suppose, it should be a good, a good reason. But many people put that off uh, for various reasons, and so a lot of people who attend our liturgies are, in fact, legally Roman Catholic. And it, it takes a kind of special event or crisis or something like that to provoke or incite them to actually make the move for a change of rights. And that's petitioned through the local priest and... Uh, it's, it's a little complicated, but it can be done. Coming to the Eastern Church for the liturgy of the Eucharist is in some ways a bit of a, of a shock to visitors from the West, Western Church, because of the way we administer Holy Communion. It's very different than a Western Roman Catholic would be used to. And it's been asked, well, how, is that, have you always done it that way? And the answer is no. The originally, of course, Christ gave his, the bread and the wine at a table with his friends. It's pretty basic. Gradually, as more people were celebrating this together, they had to find a way of being able to distribute larger amounts of the precious body and the blood of Christ in a way that was both reverent but also practical. And so smaller pieces were given and 
larger chalices were shared. In the Byzantine tradition, particularly at the height of our liturgical golden age, so we're going back to the 6th, 7th century, 8th century, uh, in Constantinople, the bread and the wine were administered separately, and uh, there were stations through the church of people, of deacons, uh, giving out the bread and the wine. In other words, it probably looked a bit like a large modern Roman Catholic church. So the way that we used to give communion is the way that the modern Roman church does it now. In our church right now, the only person that receives the bread on the hand are the clergy at the altar. So there is always a, de there's a big demarcation between the way the clergy receive communion and the way the laity do. Toward the end of the classical period, the beginning of the medieval period, uh, both the East and the West had to face the challenge of people receiving communion in a worthy way, not dropping it and not splashing it. And the West faced this issue by removing the cup from the laity. So if you go to most, even today, in the Western church, uh, with the exception of the United States, you probably, well, you do not always receive the cup, the, pres the blood of Christ. In the, that was a way to avoid splashing the chalice from receiving it, and so that the focus became the host, the, the small round host. In the East, we have used, we do not use unleavened bread. We use regular bread. And so that creates its own, its own issues about crumbs and things. As it developed in the Eastern Church, the single loaf remained very important, but was then cut into small pieces. And whereas it was originally given into the hands of the people, one at a time, and then the cup was shared, the pieces that were cut for the laity to receive eventually came to be put into the chalice, into the precious blood. And the sacrament was administered using a spoon, which is still the classic way of doing it today. A single spoon is put in and a piece of the uh, body of Christ, which has been immersed in the precious blood, is taken out and put into the mouth of the person who holds their, their mouth open. It is not closed on it, and then it's flipped over so that the sacrament is on the tongue. This is not primitive, but it is the way that the Eastern Church has addressed the situation. Now, it's interesting that during the COVID crisis, men, many churches were, uh, were told of our tradition, were told to use either disposable wooden spoons or spoons that could be individual spoons that could be sterilized so that each person received the sacrament from a separate spoon, which in some ways was a kind of return to an older custom and avoided having to have the same spoon used over and over again. Whether or not that would ever become something that we would generally do, I don't know. But it is, uh, receiving the communion is something that Western Catholics would, would feel shocked by when they see it for the first time. And so the simple, the simple instruction for that is that when you want to receive communion in an Eastern Catholic church, you are in the state of the preparation for receiving the sacrament, you come forward with everyone else, and you come forward to the priest, and uh, hold your head back, open your mouth. You don't say amen, you don't say anything. If the priest does not know who you are, they, he might ask your name, because communion is most often given personally by name. So the servant of God, uh, Joan, receives the blessed body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then you, pass, you go on from there. Simple, quick, uh, no response is needed, and all that is required is that you keep your mouth wide open and your head slightly tilted back. Father Chris has used the images of uh, the image of a baby bird being fed by its mother, which is as good as any other image I've heard for the process. But beyond that, learning when to do the sign of the cross, learning how to kiss an icon, these are things you pick up just by being in our liturgy. Thank you for watching this video. We encourage you to like, share, and subscribe. And any questions or comments can be put in the comments below.